Who here thinks that children are more creative than adults? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, what if I told you that isn't true? You're probably thinking, but wait, I've heard statistics on this. There's a, there's a TED Talk on this. <laughs> and you're right about that. In fact, the most viewed TED Talk of all time by Sir Ken Robinson is based on this very idea that children are more creative than adults. In another popular talk, he justified this view with a longitudinal study from the 1960s by George Land, which claimed to have found that 98% of five-year-olds are creative geniuses, but that only 2% of adults are. But what Sir Ken Robinson didn't know at the time is that this study doesn't actually exist. <laughs> Or to be a careful scientist, I should say, I haven't been able to find any evidence that the study ever happened. So the study itself was never published, so I had to track down the organizations that George Land claimed that he had worked with on the study. That's NASA and a U.S. organization called Head Start. Neither had ever heard of him. And neither had any record that the study had ever happened. In fact, the NASA archivist that I spoke to said that she thought maybe the study was just an urban myth. But this idea that children are more creative than adults It feels so true, doesn't it? And you know, the, the research that's been done since uh, that talk in 2006 has shown us that there's a lot more to creativity than what we originally thought. You see, I'm a, a child development researcher at the Lego Foundation, where I study creativity and learning. And the work that I've done there has shown me just how complex the creative process is and how nuanced its development is as children grow. But you know, we all know this intuitively too, because we were all children once, and here we all are as adults. We've lived this. I'll give you an example. When I was seven or eight, I used to love building these stick forts in the woods by my house. You know, the kind where you take a tree branch and you lean it up against a, a, a tree trunk in a circle. And if I built it just right, it would last me a while. And I could go there every day after school with my best friend. And we'd save a special little snack from our lunches. We'd climb inside and eat chocolate pudding with just our fingers. <laughs> But those forts, they were, they were more than just sticks in my mind. I had plans for those things. I, I somehow came up with this elaborate plan for the perfect tree house that we could build. So first of all, it would be up in the trees. It wouldn't be down on the ground. And inside it, there would be a swimming pool. <laughs> But you could cover up the swimming pool and make it into an ice skating rink when the season was right. I mean, I had ideas. I had big plans for this thing. But, you know, I never got around to building that tree house which is probably a good thing because it would have been a safety hazard. But I can still feel the exhilaration of having those ideas and imagining just how cool that treehouse would be. I had a pretty good imagination. But I really had no idea what it would take to bring that idea of the treehouse in my mind into reality. And that right there is key. Creativity is not the same thing as imagination or having big ideas. There's something else involved that takes those ideas into reality, into fruition and creative expression. There are actually many parts to the creative process, but they can be summed up by two main features, originality and appropriateness. And by appropriateness, I mean something that's meaningful and relevant for the situation at hand. So when I had this idea for a swimming pool, ice skating rink, tree house. That was original. <laughs> But it was not appropriate, not given the constraints that I would have faced as a seven-year-old, uh, with only sticks for building materials, no knowledge of engineering or building, no access to contractors, and of course, no budget. <laughs> so I might call it an imaginative idea, but it wasn't technically creative, because to be creative, it would also have to be appropriate. Now, to get this combination of originality and appropriateness, you have to be capable of two things. 
divergent thinking, which is basically about exploring possibilities, coming up with ideas, and convergent thinking, which is about basically deciding what to do. You take a look at all of those possibilities you've come up with, and you decide on the best one given your situation. <clears throat> divergent thinking includes things like exploration, originality, idea generation, risk-taking, and flexibility. Convergent thinking includes things like evaluation, logic, inhibitory control, persistence, and focus. But the key is that you need both of these things, divergent thinking and convergent thinking, to get to those two main ingredients for creativity, originality and appropriateness. But now let's think about the balance of skills that you typically associate with children and adults. So when you're thinking about exploration, idea generation, risk-taking, who are you thinking more of, children or adults? Children, right? Yeah. And when you think about evaluation, logic, inhibitory console, control, children or adults? Adults. And which of these two do you think of most often when you think about creativity? Well, many of us have a very strong bias to think almost exclusively about divergent thinking. And it's really easy to do. In fact, researchers even share this bias. Many of the studies on creativity that exist right now actually look at divergent thinking. And the problem is even greater when you look at the research on childhood creativity. There's an upcoming review that looked at all of the studies on children and creativity, and it found that 82% of those studies looked at divergent thinking. So, we're not alone in this. But keeping all of that in mind, we need to separate fact from myth. So let's take a look at the following statement. Children learn more flexibly than adults. That's true. And it can be seen pretty clearly in some work by a researcher named Alison Gopnik. She's been looking at what happens when you give uh, information to children and adults that does not support an existing bias that they have. In other words, how willing are they to change their minds when they're given new information? And this is an ability called cognitive flexibility. Now, in her studies, when adults are giving, given this evidence that does not support their bias, that confl conflicting information does not change their view of the world. But it's totally different when you look at four-year-olds. Four-year-olds will totally change their mind based on a single new piece of information. And she's found in her research that this cognitive flexibility decreases steadily from childhood to adulthood. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Children don't really have that much evidence in their database yet, right? So a single new piece of information, that's going to be pretty meaningful to them. Whereas adults, they have a whole lifetime of data points in that database to support what they already believe. And so one new piece of information will come with a grain of salt. And this actually matches what we see in brain development. So this image here reflects the synaptic density in the human brain at birth. It's sort of a complicated way of saying the number of neural connections in the brain. Now, in the early years, development focuses on exploration. In fact, in the first few years of life, more than one million new neural connections are formed every second. But as childhood goes on, development begins to focus on pruning down those connections to the ones that are most needed based on interactions with the environment. So you can put it this way. Children are born into the world ready to adapt to whatever environment they're born into, but then they specialize for the context they're actually in. It's pretty ingenious. So, keeping that in mind, let's go back to this fact check. Children learn more flexibly than adults. Yes, this is true. That strength, along with their abilities in imagination and idea generation, that means that children have enormous creative potential. But it doesn't mean that they're more creative. And that's because flexibility is only one of those abilities needed for creativity. And it just so happens to fall into that divergent thinking category. Now let's take a look at this other idea, that adults are not creative, that somehow growing up kills our creativity. Well, sometimes growing up can do that, yes. 
Sometimes we can get a bit out of balance and become quite rigid in our convergent thinking abilities, right? We can become afraid of exploration, of, of trying new things, of risk taking. And in that sense, young children can be our role models. But this notion that if we just stayed children, if we never grew up in our minds, that somehow we would be more creative, that's false. Because while children are great at exploration, they're not always great at getting the job done or, <laughs> or choosing the best solution for the situation at hand. And in fact, in adulthood, having high levels of convergent thinking and low levels, or high levels of divergent thinking and low levels of convergent thinking that's a profile that's associated with adult ADHD. So these convergent abilities are actually really important for helping us to focus and to persist through challenges toward our goals. Surprisingly, they're actually important elements of convergent thinking that even enhance our divergent thinking abilities. So we'll take inhibitory control for an example. Inhibitory control is an ability that helps us to suppress or inhibit our impulses. So for example, I've been told that I need to stay on this big red dot for my whole talk. <laughs> Fortunately for the camera operators, I have the inhibitory control to follow those instructions. But a four-year-old probably wouldn't be able to do that for a full 15 minutes, right? But this same inhibitory control that keeps us from following all our impulses and exploring everything we see it's the same inhibitory control that keeps us from fixating too much on the first or most common solution to a problem and helps us to then imagine other possibilities. I'll give you a classic example. Let's say I gave you a matchbox, a box of tacks, and a candle, and I asked you to try to attach that candle to a wall. What would you do? I'll give away the ending. Most people will take some tacks and try to tack the candle onto the wall directly. And others will try to melt the candle a bit and use the wax as a kind of glue to get that candle up on the wall, right? But neither of these solutions is going to work. The best solution is to tack the box to the wall, the box that the tacks came in, and then place the candle into the box but most adults become so fixated on that box as just a container for the tax, they don't even realize it's a resource for the problem. And that's where inhibitory control comes in. It can help you to suppress that traditional use of the box and see other possibilities there. So you can think of it this way. Creativity requires balance. If the focus becomes too heavy on divergent thinking, we can get stuck in idea generation and never bring ideas into reality. If the focus becomes too heavy on convergent thinking, we can become so stuck in our knowledge of constraints that we fail to recognize great ideas when they come along. So, how do we find that sweet spot, that balance between the two? How do we maintain cognitive flexibility while balancing that with inhibitory control? How do we maintain a fresh outlook on the world while also balancing that with expertise? We have to find some way to be both spontaneous and reflective, and that is a tough balance to strike. So how do we get there? Here's my proposal. What if children and adults worked together on co-creative teams? And I don't just mean inviting kids to your work meetings because they're cute, or encouraging parents to be more involved in their children's science fair projects. These are not true co-creative teams. What I'm talking about is real, true, creative collaboration, where adults can look to children as role models in imagination and idea generation, and children can look to adults for guidance and experience. If the two truly respect the strengths that the other brings to the table, those abilities might just become contagious. Under the playful guidance of adults, children can start to think about constraints, to problem solve, to select high-quality ideas. And under the leadership of children, 
adults can rediscover their cognitive flexibility and start considering off-the-wall ideas that they never would have entertained otherwise. But what does that look like, practically? Well, at play, parents can let their children take the lead in play, asking open-ended questions and then following their children's ideas no matter how silly they may seem. At home, Parents can invite their children to be authentic partners in the household, for example, by inviting dinner suggestions and then helping their child to select the best one, gather supplies, and then cook it. At school, teachers can look at children as more than just consumers of information, but instead as co-educators and collaborators in the classroom. Using inquiry-based methods and guided play techniques, they can build in opportunities for uncertainty in the classroom and support the children's budding convergent thinking skills while also supporting their own divergent thinking abilities. In industry, we should think of children not just as end users of products, but as co-designers who have ideas and insights that could transform and change the field. Places like Kids Team at University of Washington have had great success with this, and others could too. But I think the key is that we neither glorify nor shame one another for the creative strengths that are a normal part of human development. Children are not creative geniuses, no. But we have a lot to learn from them. And we should be careful not to communicate to them that the highest form of learning is expertise. In the same way, adults are not creative failures. And we should be careful not to shame one another for the knowledge and experience that is so critical to bringing ideas into reality. I think we have a long way to go, as parents, as teachers, as decision makers, to start emphasizing that creative balance. But it's what's required. The world is changing more rapidly than ever before and generating unpredictable dilemmas. But if children and adults can work and play together to enhance our collective creative abilities, then I think we have a pretty good chance of making this world a better place. Thank you.